Once you've successfully used the warp on Nova, you've finally entered the final planet, the dark planet, Shadra. You guys try to go back and check up on the previously injured Darum, but someone unexpected shows up to motivate us to keep going. Very odd. In the warp area, you'll find a shopkeeper who will mostly give you status healing items, as well as an HP and MP pod right beside him. Once headed right, you'll find an easily accessible warp point. Heading north towards the first bridge, we'll find, a we'll find you a chest containing a disco wig, which is used for fire mages only. Then the second bridge towards the southeast will net you two chests containing 6,000 bira and three red frogs, respectively. Continuing to the east, there are a few space police shoes flying over the sky. You know things are serious when the space police are here, am I right? Heading across the bridge will get you a putty pee in a chest. And continuing to head east, then south across the fourth bridge is a chest containing the mandrake shoes for wood mages. And after that is a set of two bridges which you find against thigmas. Specifically two pukas and a dab hansel. These guys have the same attacks once you previously faced on raisin, but they feel like they have more HP, strength, defense, and speed. Now that you're fighting them all together, it's best to go after the two pukas that will barrage you with dark magic like shadow dyes and blood money, as well as some sharp beef attacks. The dab will assault you with strong stats like swashing rollers and roller stamp, which is brutal to the front row, but he also has magic, so be careful. Again, make sure your defense is up with Shy and Sorbet, and heal with Lazzy anytime you're low on HP. Then pal him with magic from the Protag, Pico, and Mocha. The Light Mage will have a significantly easier time with these guys, compared to the Dark Mages, of course. Once you defeat them, reinforcements come. Great. But you're saved by... feelings? And they want you to escape into the cave. But before we do, we have a lot of enemies to cover. On the outside of Cocoa Butter Valley, we have a grand total of six new enemies to face. First is the Condemned. These guys are wind mages and they are very similar to the Slashback Lump of Foon, but they have the same attacks in the single suite and the front row Snatch, which is very strong. They also have a team that have a high crit chance. I just be me though. Next we have the Sacrificer. These guys are similar to both the Lope and the Buffalo Herd, but more similar to the standard ones on Grim because they're attack they have the same attack in the Lance Trick for the front row and requesting backup for when they're alone. But when they request for backup, they find the Condemned, and when you do, they can use the Summoning Offering to spawn our next enemy, which is the Recreal. Wow, these names are damn edgy. But they resemble the Elder Dragon Bucky on Earth, with attack being a small hole attack, which can do quite a lot, and Crystal Laser, which can also do quite a lot. But the main reason you should fight them is because they have a chance to drop a piece of the Wing Set, which is one of the best equipment sets in the game, so don't miss your chance to grab it. We also have a lot of dark critters here, including the Tin Swordsman. These guys are super simple. They only have a leaping side attack and they are super weak, but fast. Next we have the Hodmidot, similar to the Scarecrow, but these guys are rocking some muted colors. They only have a strong switch attack, but they're also packing a part of the wing set, so fight them until you get at least one of them. Finally is the Grizzly Goat. These big beasts are quite formidable, with a fairly strong scratch attack and they'll move called Tornado Dance, which can hurt anyone in the front row. It's the last enemy on the outside with part of the wing set, so take him down. Once we enter the Choco Milk Caves, you'll soon see that these are the magicians Kale kidnap, but Madeline uses the last of her energy to save them. The horrific sight of seeing so many innocent magicians weakened or even killed. You soon see. Hey, haven't I seen you before? Uh, Carbon? Anyways, Carbon tells us how there's a worm in the furthermost cave, the Krogamar Caves, which both Kale and Madeline await. But before we leave, to the east, more enigmas show up and try to ambush all of us. Oh no, this could be the end of our magical heroes. Well, look at the video link, you dolt. The space loser here and are here to help, because General Luxor and Bree Puri are here to save us, and all the injured magicians as well. It took them long enough to get to their senses, and only took them ten parts. But we're not, we're not done with the enemies here, because now in the overworld we have the Equalella crew. And admittedly, he's actually the easiest one here. I mean, he can hypothetically set up a bunch of jackpots, but when it's dark out, he can also do a lot of damage. But his only damaging attack is Shadow Die. And I mean, he also has Celestial Swap too, but it's not like it really matters at all. He only has 8,000 HP, and this mini boss can be easily overwhelmed with an onslaught of attacks. Finally, about the last of the overworld treasure, but make sure you watch out for the big scary enigmas that roam around the overworld. You'll immediately find a warp point as soon as you see Bree defeat the Enigmas. Heading north into the cliffside, and then heading right will be a chest containing a putty pea. Heading west will get you three lemon jams in a chest. Continue on the main route, after crossing the bridge, head right to find a star robe in a chest. And by heading to the main route to the end, you'll find a secret chest at night containing a putty pea. And after fully heading north, you'll find another pizza warp in front of, a, in front of the caves and an HP pot. But make sure you warp back to get some last minute items and heal up your HP and MP. 
because we can't have good things and Char is angry because this is the first time we're mentioning him in the script. So he tries to kill us. The final Char part could definitely throw new players off the first time if they played too recklessly, but realistically he's one of the easier fights. Of course he has Celestial Swap, you wouldn't be a boss without it, but he also comes packing the ultimate kick, the Kick of Darkness, which hits all the party members. Then onto his magical abilities. His main method of attacking is Dazzle Dart, which he can hit up to 10 times and induce a multitude of stat-lowering debuffs. He can also come rocking blood money, and since he's in the back row, it'll hit 3 times instead of 1. His most deadly attack is, oddly enough, Finger Pointer. He'll aim at a target, and then after a few turns, proceed to hit Shadow Die, Blood Money, and Kick of Darkness, all at once. As soon as you see this, block with the character. So let's talk about strategies. The easiest way to come back this battle? Sparkling Shield. This will nullify Charge attacks, especially Dazzle Darts. Make sure you set up a Minty Fresh just while you're at it to boost Spirit. Flash, you should always have MP to purchase the Healing Wings, but you should also be on item doing. And as for the rest of them, kill him! This battle is even easier if you're a Light Mage. Seriously, you can end this fight in under 10 turns if you play your cards right, but with a little bit of luck. But if you're a Dark Mage, just turn into a Stalling War. Char will never outpace you even if you don't use items. After the battle, Char mentions that although you have beat him, Kale is still at large and then the time for saving is nearly over. Then he explodes. But hey, Knuckle Slayer is here to help you, so that's nice. So heal back up, save your game, ignore the second dead body, and enter the Krogamore Caves. And I know we're about to head to the dank chambers of the caves, but instead we're going to talk about an egg character now, just to break up this climactic action. So how about those enigmas you face? Wouldn't you love to have one? No? Of course you do. So here, take this small lad and call him something cute like Melvin or something like that. Why? Well, because I'm going to play the clip again. You're my friend now. We're having soft tacos later. Thanks again, bestie. Anyways, this is the very last egg character, the Puka. It's one of seven available egg characters in Magical Star Sign when you're using the multiplayer function. The two ways of getting it vary depending on which element you chose at the beginning of the game. If you start as a dark mage, all you need to do is max out your tags with multiplayer, so get 100 different save files into one file, then they add gift to you. Or if you're a light mage, you need to avoid picking up every single gummy frog in the save file, which mostly includes picking them off the ground. From chests and from enemies are okay, and it won't be counted, similar to Magical Vacation. After you beat the light planet, head back to the Queen Chamber in the Sparkling Palace, and talk to the assistant, and he'll give you an egg once you return to your ship. The Puga is a very odd little fella to have in battle. His out of battle ability is increasing the chances of wild battles, which is not really that good. <laughs> its exclusive ability, Rebirth, which when used will revive another party member at the cost of dropping your stats. I mean, yes, you have wakey tails, but it can be useful in situations when you have those tails. As for its magic, it has zero joker by default and its signature, Crystal Egg, which randomly brings down a stat of the overall enemy. Overall, it's a very useful party member, not for exploring purposes. Alright, back to the plot. The Krongamar Cave starts off very ominously, with the whole bodies of pirate otters coated in a mysterious gummy coat. It looks like Kale was trying to use them for the food for the worm. Yikes. As for the cave itself, it's honestly one of the shortest dungeons in the game. Like, if you ignored everything, you could probably get through here in under like 3 minutes with the battles included. But there's also a lot of treasure to get here. First, go up towards the center area, then head right to the rightmost chamber to find a chest in the corner containing 5,000 Bira. Then a bit further down, you'll find another chest containing some cobalt studs. And if you head to the left, you'll find a long passage which contains two chests containing some melon jam and earth armor for earth mages only. Then, heading north of the first floor will contain a room with many ladders. Heading down the right ladder and heading right will get you three red frogs in the chest, and then going down to the right, you'll find you a chest containing a putty bait. Heading right into the first set of staircases, then heading up, then over to the next one, then heading down, the ladder to the right will give you five red frogs. The third and fourth ladder in the next chambers lead to the same floor above, but if you head up to the third ladder, then go to the first down ladder you see, you'll find a chest containing some moccasins, and heading to the, the fourth ladder and going down the first down ladder you see, you'll find you two chests containing 8,000 bira and a putty pea. Finally, heading fully south on the floor above with the ladders, going down, you'll get you five yellow worms. For progression, go down the middle ladder on the highest floor in the north, and on the northeast, you'll find remains of the worm's dinner, meaning that the next room is north, and 
that's our final boss. But before we go, let's talk about our last four enemies. We need to grind a bit anyways. So how many enemies could be in here? I mean, it's a short dodge, you know, it'd be 16 enemies! That's almost three times as much as the outside! <sighs> well, let's go and talk about them one at a time. <gasps> First, we have the Vinyl Joe. This little guy is a fire mage with a tackle attack, still fairly strong, but not overwhelming. Second, we have both the Fire Belcher as well as the Sea Galter. I lump these two together because they are both very similar. The Vinyl Belcher mainly uses fire based spells like Magma Roads, and as for the Sea Galter, it not only has a similar as Ice for Mods, but it also has a Hailstorm in the front row specifically. They also both have a physical attack and bite off, which sounds gross, but it's a lot more deadlier than the thing. Next, we have the Grample. Similar to the Elder Beetle back on Gren, they have a very standard skill in Acro Drop, but they also have a magical spell in Briar Pad, which can be quite deadly, so be careful with them. Afterward, we have the Heroist. These guys are closely resembled the Horrors from the Profoon, but they are deadlier. They have the same dive ball attack, but they can utilize Falcon Dive now, which would be quite fierce, because they always like to be in the back row and they are very fast. Continuing on to the plan turn, these guys only have a tackle attack, and they have somehow surviving on half a brain cell. Help them. Then we have the Booga Clops. These guys are similar to the other guy Clops on Raisin, and they have a very similar attack in a slug move and a magic and a vibrant dance. So watch out for that. Following we have the King Crowd. These towering crustaceans have two physical skills in Cleave and Sand Blaster, which can be attacked in the front row, but they can also utilize Sparkling Shield to pass against the magical attacks. You got their item with the Crab Husk, which can power up your Brawly Ball and about buff spirit. Upcoming is the Reverse Yield. These are the most unique enemy in the area. Every time you attack Reverse Yield, they change form from light to dark. In their light forms, they'll either use Crystal Laser in the front row or Blinding Light in the back row. In their dark form, they'll only use Shadow Dive, but it'll obviously attack one member in the front and it'll attack the back three times. Take care of them quickly. Adjacent, we have the Rainbow King. And hey, it's a recolor of a boss this time. It's a light mage with attack with Arc Light and Crystal Laser, but I couldn't really get footage of the Crystal Laser. These guys are stubborn. Anyway, since it's in the back row, will attack all party members. Be careful of them, they're very strong. Then comes the Cosmic Rider. Glad I copied the Hank Finn because serving in the stars is awesome. He's a light mage with Arc Light, but also uses the move Stardust Ride to hit a whole row of characters. Very cool. Subsequently, we have the Melianac. Which is, this one is a strictly a magic user, with units moves such as Blood Money and Dazzle Darts, as well as Celestial Swap to mess with your strategies. You can either be in the front or back row, so be careful of that fact. After that, we have the Spear Shank. These guys are Dark Mages without Dark Magic, only just thinking physical skills with Stabby Jabs and Skull Skewers. Actually, the same attacks as the other Spear user, the Sea Pony back on Cassia. A budding is the Goblin Dog, and remember the Hardy Dog? Yeah, this is them if you don't love dogs. They are much more physical with moves such as Crushing Attack and a Yell Attack, so watch out for that. Later is the Grim Barber. These guys are similar to the Shy Clones back on Buffoon, but dark and even more edgy, with moves similar to Soul Humber and a new move called Darkness Eternal, which hits everyone and lowers your MP, and they also have a chance to curse you. This guy also has part of the wing set, so grab it. And last but not least is the Beetle Boar. These three creatures also have Darkness Eternal, but also has physical skills and the Wave Attack and a Suspicious Smirk. And this is the last enemy we have the wind set, so don't forget to grab it when you beat him. God, that was awful! Okay, so we're at the final battles of the game. Once you step through this door here, there's no turning back. You gotta prepare for three major battles ahead, but you do have two options. Option one is to save your game here to not risk getting soft locked out of going to the post-game dungeon, and to do all three battles consecutively, and if you get a game over, you start right back at the beginning. Or option two is to save outside of the area in one final, then, once you be in a boss, save on a different file to keep one save without losing any sort of the progress. The only downside is you're not actually going to get the bestiary edges after you beat them. I also recommend going with the strongest weapon you have, slash a fort. Here's mine for reference. Finally, go get as many healing frogs, worms, status removing tails, bombs, and even jams if you're not feeling confident. These are the hardest battles in the game, and with all that said and done, let's go to the final gauntlet. Once you've stepped into the giant larva's chamber, you'll not only see the enormous beast, but Madeline in the chamber below. So, you have no choice but to fight the giant larva. The giant larva may seem big and intimidating, but it's actually rather predictable. You see, its main attack is a crushing move, which hits everyone in it, but it's extremely slow. But it does have another trick of its... weird sleeves. It will use the move Weapon Vortex, which will absorb your magic right from you. You'll know when this is happening when the screen doesn't zoom in on your character. In about three terms of absorption, it will use Mega Burn Cannon, but thankfully this only targets one character. But depending on the power of the moves you try to use, the more damage the Mega Burn Cannon will deal. This may seem random, but every even numbered turn you try to attack it on, it will use Weapon Vortex. You'll also know it'll be charging when the worm's back gets a little bit more detailed. The key for defeating this worm is just figuring out which turn you're on, which is just how many times you've attacked. Plus, this worm is super slow, so setting up defenses with parsley walls and mother's nest is simple enough. 
just try to take this fight slow and simple, and if you want to do something on those odd number turns, try healing or using an item. Or kick it. I don't know, that kind of works I guess. Just remember what turn you're on currently, and this fight should be very simple. Once this larva is taken down, Sorbet remembers a vision that she had back with Kale back on Raisin. And when she's brought back to reality, she notices everyone's bodies is turning into gummies. While that is going on, the space police have brought in robots from Erd for reinforcements. Surely that won't be a bad thing, right? And after heading right to the following chamber, it's just a short walk at the bottom floor. Though you'll probably encounter a few enemies here and there. But I recommend just taking them down or running away from them. You're still a little weak on levels. Once you find the end, you'll note you'll see an HP and MP pot, as well as a shopkeeper that sells the perfect items for the fights up ahead. Heal up and head inside to not only see Madeline in the farthest chamber, but one man who is able to stop you. Master Kale. <laughs> Bet you never expected to face another boss alongside Kale. The Gummy Giant will immediately use Sword of Light, with Kale bringing its beast back to consciousness, with the sole goal to kill you. The first thing to immediately mention is that no matter what element you are, Kale will always be the opposite alignment that you are, and the Gummy Giant will have the same alignment as you, no matter what. Starting off with Kale, he is known as the strongest wizard in the galaxy, and the fact that he has 10 different spells of each element is nothing to scoff at. He has Heat Fondue, Briar Patch, Falcon Dive, Gravel Pounder, Absolute Zero, Blood Money, Dazzle Darts, Crystal Laser, Celestial Swap, and his signature move, Insect Bullet. This move summons up to 20 insects to shoot at you and has a chance to lower your spirit, which is very deadly for a magic only user. And may I remind you, he's always in the back row, meaning that moves like Heat Fondue, Briar Patch, and Crystal Laser will hit everyone, and you can easily sleep through your team if you're not careful. Let's not forget about the Jummy Giant, too. He's mainly a physical attacker, and its main attack is the Gummy Sword which will attack anyone within the front row, and it's extremely hard to reflex guard, it may not even be worth it in the end. Its other attack is Gummy Spread, which is probably the strongest physical move you'll face so far. It's a giant laser that will hit everyone for massive damage. It can even power it up even more if it uses the move Fill Up on the previous turn. Combining these two sheer power and versatility means that you're in for a world of hurt. But here are some good tips fighting with through this battle. The biggest thing is to target Kale at all costs. He's the most powerful character here, and even if you get unlucky even once, it might cost you the entire battle. And since he's always in the opposite element of yours, there's a strong chance he only might get three moves off if you manage to kill him fast. So I bet we should immediately use Sparkling Shield, which can negate a lot of Kale's weaker attacks, like Dazzle Darts and Insect Bullets. Chat should also set up Minty Freshness and plenty of healing worms for the Tag, Sorbet, and Lassie. Lassie should always be on healing duty, and while the rest should just target Kale. And once Kale is down, you should have no problem dealing with the Gummy Giant. I also recommend starting off with a plan to line, which will bait Kale into using Celestial Swap, meaning you'll have time to set up. Just use all this info that you've previously known, and don't worry if things get too crazy. Patience is key with this fight. After the fight, Kale mentions that the beast is still feeding off the gummified air, as well as all the magic is going around currently. Kale finally disappears, marking an end to his tyranny. You guys are still getting gummified, so be careful, time is of the essence. But we do see a scene on Ur where the machines aren't really responding. Interesting. Go back and heal up, save your own confident here, march forward to see Madeline, and she's barely breathing. But everyone's trying their best to dig up. Except Sorbet, who has just given up on everything. I mean, I would too if I knew that the robots were going to attack, but when's the chance that that's gonna happen? Oh, it's happening now! Oh god! Mocha freaks the heck out and hurts everyone and tries to absorb all their gummyish bodies until Mocha's heart overtakes the machine and explodes. But when all hope is lost, a faint voice from Madeline is heard. She tells everyone to feed the worm with magic and to make a new light. So, everyone uses their magic, including Mocha, who the only functioning thing left in him is his heart. He's using the magic to break open the cocoon, revealing the strongest creature in the galaxy. Shadra.
Chandra is the true final battle in Magical Star Sign. It will definitely be the hardest battle you'll face up to this point. Chandra's main gimmick is, is after every turn it uses a move, it will transform into any of the seven elements from fire, wood, wind, earth, water, light, and dark. Always keep on your toes of what Chandra is and how to combat it. Chandra also has several magic attacks to keep you busy. Five out of the seven elements, in fact. Heat Fondue and Fire, Briar Patch and Wood, Falcon Dive for Wind, Gravel Pounder for Earth, and Absolute Zero for Water, and of course, always carrying Celestial Swap, which is deadly due to having lots of magic and maybe any element. Also, no matter what, even if she is powered up and you hit, like, I don't know, a Heat Fondue on Chai, it will still do massive damage, even if the Fire Plant isn't aligned. If you think you're safe on the physical side, then no. She also has a move called Scale, where she uses her wings to damage you and make you lose some MP. This gal makes Master Kale look weak in comparison. Strategies are going to be difficult when, the, when you're in this position, especially when Mocha starts off with 1 HP. Chandra will basically guarantee if you either have a bad start or a good start. If you start with something like Briar Patch or Heat Fondue, then it's a horrible start. But if she starts off with something like Celestial Swap, then it's a good start. She is always in the back row, meaning that she'll hit everyone. But there are ways to combat it. Like if you have the if you took the time to get all the wings set for someone like Sorbet to start off with Sparkling Shield or heal up Mocha, that will negate some of that deadly damage. But the same plan is always when it comes to your, what your party does. Chai should always do to the pens and support. Lashu should always be healing. Sorbet should be shield managing and shield silence and maybe some attacking here and there. But for Pico, Mocha, and the Protag can always just deal heavy damage. Mocha is permanently on the ground, meaning that he can't move or do physical attacks or even use items, but he can still guard and use magic. After some heavy damage, Chandra will start to explode, which will show you that you're getting closer and closer to winning. Just keep adding on the damage until more explosions happen. This is definitely the hardest part of the fight, and after the third explosion, you may think that you're done with it, but unfortunately, it's only the beginning. Now, Chandra has entered its true form. It will now permanently be the opposite of your element, either light or dark. Her new attacks are Stabby Fork, which is a deadly physical move that you can't block and her magic moves are even deadlier. Still packing Celestial Spot for all the chaos that's on her mind. She also has Prism Barrier, which can negate all attacks if you aren't careful. Make sure she doesn't use that, otherwise it might spell doom. Easily, her two most devastating attacks are her light move, Paragem Shift, which is a move that can damage up to six times and has a chance to lower spirit, and the Big Crunch, with her using all of her energy to summon a black hole to swallow you completely, then exploding, doing catastrophic damage. She can easily end you here if you're not careful. This part of the fight may look a lot scarier, but thankfully it's way more consistent. Make sure you always keep your protagonists alive, they'll be doing the big damage. Your MP may be very low after the first phase. This is why I recommend using not using any of the red rooms you've collected up to this point, just so you have enough magic to kill this wretched beast. Using items like jams and debuffs are also a prominent strategy to make sure this fight, fight goes as smoothly as possible. But the same will always go. Just make sure you keep staying alive because every attack does so much damage. Make sure you're always powered up no matter what when it comes to Chandra. It might be difficult timing when you are a light and dark mage, just make sure any strategy is possible. And after 35,000 HP, the final boss will be defeated. And after a grand explosion of light from the cave that passes through the planet, a new sun is formed, showing everyone across the galaxy a brand new light. So let's wake up Lassie and Chai, talk to Mocha who's miraculously still alive, DON'T SAVE HERE, YOU'LL BE SOFT LOCKED, and finally, save your teacher. Wait, where is she going? No, don't leave. I've burned 14 different parts in two years looking for you. Come on, man, don't leave, I'm sad! That was an ending. And that was the main story of Magical Star Sign Tutorial. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this whole series. This was a massive project that lasted so much longer than I anticipated. We've seen so many people, fought so many foes, and collected so much treasure along the way. And it feels weird just to end it here. But let's say that this is not the end. Rather, we have a few more things to talk about before the tutorial series ends. And if you have played Star Sign before, you'll know already how painful the next part will be. I'll see you next time for the Glissini Caves. Thanks for watching.